Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two, then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Atlin, British Columbia, Canada. This little town is about two hours from Whitehorse and is just south of the province boundaries of British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. The elevation is a little over 2,200 feet in town, but climbs to over 6,200 feet on nearby mountain peaks. Nestled along its namesake lake, Atlin is surrounded by gently sloping hills covered in Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, and ponderosa pine stands, interrupted by big leaf maple and red alder. Animals here include whitetail and mule deer, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, Yukon moose, and a caribou here and there. The predators here include lynx, coyotes, cougars, wolves, black bears, and brown bears. On the evening of June 5, 2017, Rick Cowan and his girlfriend, whom we'll call Rita, were just sitting down to enjoy a glass of wine together. Rick had placed a small bag of trash just outside the front door, which he planned to put in the canister in a few minutes. They'd just finished spending a few hours relaxing while working in their garden. Rick was an avid outdoorsman and was used to seeing bears, even near his home. The week before this incident, he'd chased away a curious black bear, which left with no problems. Rick's home was on the outskirts of town, so he knew better than to leave garbage or food outside his home for a prolonged time period. Living in bear country was something he was just comfortable with, as long as the bears behaved predictably. As Rita sat on the couch, the family dog Snickers began barking outside the front door. Rita glanced through the front window, and at the end of the driveway she could see two large grizzly bears appear and slowly walk toward the house. Rita got Rick's attention and encouraged him to get the dog inside. Rick peered through the window to see two perfect representations of the grizzly bear species. Their guard hairs were tipped with a silver sheen, and their dished profile and hump of muscle on their shoulders made their identification undeniable. He also noticed that there was something unusual about the behavior of these bears. They weren't skittish about being near a house, and presented themselves boldly. Rick walked over to the front door and called Snickers, hoping his voice and sudden appearance might frighten the bears away. As soon as they heard his voice and saw him in the doorway, both bears dashed toward Rick in unison. Even though he was experienced with grizzlies, Rick was terrified. He opened the front door and let Snickers in, and then slammed it shut when the bears were within five feet of entering the house. The grizzlies paused and examined the doorway, possibly unsure of where Rick had disappeared. On Rick's property was a guest cabin, and his teenage daughter, whom we'll call Jennifer, was hidden inside. Her dog, Pippin, was cowering outside the door to the cabin, hoping to be let in before the grizzlies noticed him. Rick watched the grizzlies through the windows and worked his way to an open one. He shouted to Jennifer to let Pippin into the cabin with her. Jennifer opened the door while the bears were only fifteen yards or so away. As soon as they saw the door open, they dashed in unison toward her in the same manner they had pursued Rick. Jennifer slammed the door after letting Pippin inside, and the bears were only three feet from entering. Now Rick had made a decision previously that he was seriously regretting. He had several hunting rifles, but had stored them in his father's gun safe and out of reach of his children. Grandpa's house was only a five-minute drive away, but it might as well have been a million miles. The only weapon he could find was a large kitchen knife, which granted him a modicum of confidence. Rick picked up the phone and dialed his father's number, hoping he would pick up quickly. Rick's father did pick up and couldn't believe the details he was listening to. I'm sure he thought it may have been some kind of prank, but as soon as he was reassured it wasn't, he grabbed his rifle and headed right over. Now Rick's father was a real bear hugger, if you will. He was probably the last person in town to want to hurt or kill a bear. As he drove over, his mind raced with the dire straits his family was now facing. While Rick waited for his father to arrive, he stood inside the front door and observed the grizzlies from only one foot away. The steel door would have been no match for the bears if they'd known to push on it, but it acted as a safety barrier for now. As he waited, he thought of Claudia Huber and Matthias Leniger. Only three years prior, they'd been besieged by a grizzly bear that chased them through their home and eventually attacked and killed Claudia. The details of their account is on this channel, and I've linked to it in the video article below for your review. The similarities are very eerie. Rick fought panic as his daughter was in the cabin and he was helpless to keep her safe. 
Despite his experience outdoors, he never imagined being held hostage in his own home by not just one, but two full-grown grizzly bears. Rick watched the grizzlies tearing into the garbage bag just outside the door when he heard the horn of his father's truck honking as he pulled up. For those of you impressed with the idea that loud noises could be used as a deterrent for bears, pay attention to the following details. Rick watched in dismay as the bears simply turned their heads and looked in Grandpa's direction. They didn't bolt as he'd hoped and walked towards the honking truck. Grandpa was still reluctant to kill the grizzlies. He poked his rifle from the window of his truck and fired a shot into the woodpile a few yards away from the bears. He hoped the loud noise would drive the bears off, but the grizzlies picked up their pace while they headed toward him. Now knowing that these bears were not afraid of anything they should be, he drew down on the closest bear and fired. His bullet struck the bear in the chest, and after only a few seconds, that bear died. The other grizzly looked at Grandpa for a second, then glanced back at the dead grizzly. It laid down next to its partner and sniffed the dead bear, between nervous mouthfuls of dandelions. After a minute or so, the uninjured bear slowly wandered off into the nearby forest. Relief filled the family as they emerged from the house and the cabin. Grandpa didn't want to shoot either of the grizzlies, let alone both of them, and expressed relief at the departure of the second bear. Police and local wildlife officers arrived soon and listened to the recounting of the incident. They looked around and informed Rick and his father that they would file a report indicating the shooting was a justifiable defense of home and property. They drove around the area and tried to locate the second grizzly. The officials left, but that doesn't mean the trouble with the other grizzly was over. After the officials left, Rick departed for his father's house to retrieve his rifles. Within twenty minutes, he had returned and began checking his firearms over to make sure they were operable and ready, just in case. As he looked over his rifles, Rick's children began screaming that the bear was back. He shuffled through the house and peered out of a window to locate the bear. He could see it only a few feet from the house, so he packed his rifle right out the front door. As Rick rounded the corner, the grizzly turned and looked straight at him. He began to walk toward him with no hesitation and demonstrated an aggressive presence. This time Rick was not terrified. He was putting an end to this torment for once and for all. He aimed at the grizzly's chest and fired. The bear retreated a few yards, staggered a little, then tipped over dead. Now having the final puzzle piece needed to finish their investigation, police and wildlife officers returned to gather information. Given how close the second grizzly carcass was to the Cowan's home, their investigation was remarkably brief. A second clear-cut case of self and property defense was their conclusion in this second grizzly killing as well. The grizzlies were very close to the same size and weighed around 350 pounds, indicating that they were young adults of around four years of age. As they chatted with Rick, the investigators noted that the two grizzlies' behavior was extremely dangerous, indicating that they've likely been habituated to people and may have been fed by a well-intending person or had found food in area garbage cans and bird feeders. The bears had boldly and aggressively charged people, despite barking dogs, human voices, a honking vehicle, and rifle shots. They should have fled to the shelter of the nearby woods, but stared and stalked toward what they could have only seen as their prey. I've had a similar experience with a large black bear in central Idaho. I will tell you that it is unnerving to have a bear staring at you from close range, but when they start coming toward you, you realize that they are not afraid of you, and may even tend to kill and eat you. Rick later stated that he was still baffled by the behavior of the grizzlies. He indicated the game officials believed the grizzlies were litter mates who had never separated to find their own lives. They noted that the more aggressive and bolder grizzly seemed to energize its litter mate. Rick expressed regret that both bears had to be killed and stated that the grizzlies' carcasses were given to the Taku River Flingit First Nation. Portions of the grizzlies were likely consumed or utilized as ceremonial artifacts or incorporated into artwork. The mental lab is powered by the thoughts of possible scenarios that may have been played out if only a few things were changed. What if the family had remained in their garden a few more minutes instead of going inside their home? Is it realistic to think that the entire family may have been injured or killed and eaten? What would have happened if the grizzlies had entered the cabin sheltering Jennifer? Rick would have had to watch as his daughter was at the mercy of two aggressive grizzlies. How would you handle such a terrifying situation? I'll gladly read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. 
Today's episode takes us to the Bear Mountain Nordic Ski Trails near Dawson Creek in northeastern British Columbia, Canada. The Bear Mountain Ski Hill is a very inconspicuous place for a predatory bear attack. For miles around the largest town in the area, Dawson Creek, lay cultivated farmland cut from prior forests. The elevation here is around 2,700 feet high and varies only because of the slight roll in the mostly flat terrain. To the south of town is a pretty expansive stretch of forest, and the final approach of that forest is the Bear Mountain Ski Hill. It's aptly named after it barely qualifies as a hill, with only a 300-foot drop from the top of its path to the bottom. The dense stands of quaking aspen, balsam poplar, and various fir and spruce trees to the south extend just past the ski hill and shroud it as part of the wilderness to human users. According to the pictures on the website, which I have posted a link to in a pinned comment, Bear Mountain is a great place for area residents to learn to ski and snowboard in the winter, but also a great place to wander and hike the remaining seasons of the year. Each fall, the varying stands of deciduous trees and evergreens offer hikers a brilliant palette for their photographs. Wolverine Trail is part of the Ski Hills Nordic Ski Trail system and is flatter than the downhill trails. Visiting hikers during the months without snow can walk these trails and vent their energy as well as the beautiful embrace of the trees offered to them. That is exactly what brought 30-year-old Leoset Kanoi here. The energetic and happy woman worked assisting disabled adults for her job after immigrating to Canada 15 years ago from the Philippines. She had met and married the love of her life, Gary Hansen, while serving Dawson Creek's community. Hansen admired his wife for her appreciation of the outdoors, stating that she frequently went camping and hiking and enjoyed photographing the Canadian wilderness and scenic landscapes. 48-year-old Annalyn Shirtliff Bartolome had brought along her niece Wanali, as well as her teenage son Kelly. The four nature lovers ventured out together on the evening of October 3, 2022, hoping to get pictures of the fall leaves as the evening sun set across the forests. But this day, the fall changes brought a more desperate visitation than they had bargained for. Just as the dark began to set in a little after 7 p.m., the four family and friends were returning to their vehicles after enjoying their hike and pictures together. Leah set, Annalyn, and Wena Lee walked side by side, and Kelly meandered slightly behind, still glancing at the colors and trees, making his reluctant retreat. As Kelly walked and thought, he heard a strange thumping on the ground behind the group, as if a large man was stomping toward them. He quickly turned and could see a large black bear in full gallop, closing in on the four hikers. Kelly yelled out, Bear! Run! Run! A little information about predatory behavior is in order to understand what exactly was going on at this time. Predators across the board, from sharks to tigers, will approach their prey whenever eyes are not on them. Sometimes they sneak up stealthily, and other times they storm in quickly. The two different approaches serve two different purposes. When a predator is sneaking up on a solitary prey animal, a subdued approach is frequently utilized to avoid inducing a panicked escape by the prey animal. When there are several prey animals, a quick and aggressive charge by the predator can be used to scatter the prey into a vulnerable and chaotic retreat. As prey animals retreat, they frequently direct their vision and consequently their defensive tools, like their mouths and claws or antlers, away from a pursuing predator, making a safer ambush for them possible. Converging suddenly on the hikers had exactly the intended reaction, as the group immediately fled in panic. Now before you start chiding the hikers about running, consider a few things. They were not expecting to see a black bear or likely any animal, while they hiked. They hadn't brought bear spray, an air horn, nor a firearm, as proof of their expectations. They had numbers, and were hiking in an area frequented by people, and located only a few hundred feet from the paved Loiselle subdivision road. This isn't a remote hiking trip in an area where bear activity is regularly reported. As the group fled, the elder of the group, Anna Lynn, stumbled as the others made their escape. 
As she pulled herself back to her feet, the black bear bit onto her head and wrestled her to the ground by tossing its head back and forth. Though she screamed and grabbed at the bear's muzzle, she was no match for its power and aggression. Leazette was in full sprint by the time she heard Annalyn's cries for help. She stopped and began trotting back toward her friend, lost in the conundrum of what to do to save her. Leazette heard Annalyn uttering something in Tagalog. I love you, my son. Tell your sister I love her. Tell our families in the Philippines I love them. Hearing her friend's resignation to her fate was enough to move Leoset to do something very few people would even consider. Having no weapon with her, Leoset armed herself with a large stick and proceeded toward the bear. She jammed the end of the stick into the bear's mouth, trying to pry Annalyn's head from its teeth. Leoset pried and pushed on the stick, but wasn't convincing the bear to release its hold on Annalyn before Kelly found his inner warrior. Somehow Kelly had stopped running, and in his youthful mind, abandoned all concern for his own safety. He sprinted back toward his mother, as she was in the bear's jaws. He grabbed a stick and splintered it over the bear's head. Kelly attacked the bear with his fists, while Leah Set kicked it. They were administering a black bear bead down, until the black bear beat back. As Kelly boxed the bear, it turned and swatted him across his chest, sending him flying and onto his back several feet away. Leah Set was still jabbing at the bear with a stick when it released its grip on Annalyn to swat Kelly. As the bear spun back toward Annalyn, it clamped its jaws onto Leah Set's wrist and jerked her back and forth violently. Now feeling compelled into the fight, Wenneli charged in with her own stick and struck the bear. She also threw Leoset's cell phone at it, in desperation. Leoset did something irrational and desperate, something I've never heard of anyone doing to save the life of their friend. She threw herself across Annalyn's body and wrapped her arms around her friend to shield her from the bear. Leoset's actions turned the two women into a ball of legs and arms. Given their vulnerable areas were facing each other, Leoset's decision to throw herself over her friend created a predatory dilemma for the bear. It bit into one of the most accessible parts it could get to, which was Annalyn's arm, and dragged the women further into the bushes together. Kelly and Wendy Lee continued to yell and throw things at the bear as it dragged Annalyn and Leoset away from the trail. Both women began to wave the younger hikers off, instructing them to go get help. Kelly and Wenneli decided finding someone to shoot the bear was their best chance and headed toward a ski cabin. They dialed 911 on their cell phones and sheltered inside the cabin until authorities could arrive. While at the mercy of the black bear, Leah Set was bitten on her arms, scalp, hips, and neck as she curled into a ball trying to protect herself. She prayed and rebuked the bear's attack and the pain it brought in Jesus' name. After her prayer, the black bear bit onto the back of her neck and tossed her back and forth, trying to break her neck and end her life. After an hour, the RCMP and a few community volunteers arrived and began searching for the women. For the past hour, the bear had sat atop of Anna Lynn and alternated between chewing on the women's arms to pull them apart and apparently waiting for them to die. As the search team neared their location in the dark, the women shook the bushes around them and whispered pleas for help, afraid to rouse the bear to a renewed attack. Staff Sergeant Damon Werrell peered through the darkness and searched the brush, lit by his flashlight. He suddenly heard a faint voice say, Help, bear, to his left, and pointed his flashlight to illuminate the women. He could see they were drenched in blood, and their arms were mangled and tattered. A shadow shifted amongst the bushes, and Sergeant Worrell could make out the shape of the bear only a few yards from the women. He knew that the presence of the bear indicated that it was intending to eat the women, and it was determined to defend what it recognized as its food. Sergeant Worrell took quick aim and fired at the bear, and the bear disappeared from view in the darkness. It wasn't heard scampering through the brush, so the officers knew that it was likely where they had last seen it. Having no idea where the bear was located, they pushed their way toward Anna Lynn and Leah Set to help them. After getting the women to the paramedics, they were flown by medical helicopters to hospitals that could handle their injuries. Anna Lynn was flown to a Vancouver hospital and was listed in stable but serious condition. The staff gave her a 50% chance of losing her left arm, given she had a high risk of developing an infection in it. 
The bear had severed her radial nerve in her shoulder, which could cause loss of function. She also suffered injuries to her thigh from the bear's teeth. Leosette was flown to Edmonton Royal Alexandra Hospital, where she was initially given a 50% chance of survival due to the seriousness of her injuries from the attack. She received stitches in her arms, scalp, and pins in her hands to hold her fingers straight until they could heal. Both women faced a very long road to recovery following the bear attack that nearly claimed their lives. For months following the attack, Leah Set would wake up and pray that God would take away the memories and nightmares. Following the report of the attack on the hikers, Dawson Creek rallied to raise funds to offset their medical expenses. Local business owners and community members organized events that helped the women pay their expensive medical bills and demonstrated just how loved they are. As for the bear, the Mounties did kill it when they fired at it in the bushes. A necropsy was completed and no other details were reported about it, other than it was a large male and that its actions were recognized as strictly predatory in nature. Nothing regarding its health, age, or condition was made available. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Have you ever visited a hiking trail near the edge of town and seen a black bear? Would you expect to see one in a location such as the Bear Mountain Ski Hill? Do you find it concerning that the bear attacked a group of four people? The next time you go out for fall pictures, will you be careful to look around to make sure there's no big black bears sneaking up on you? I'm pretty sure I will. I'll be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Tahoe National Forest in Sierra County, California. Near the little town of Comptonville are rolling forests of four kinds of pine, two types of fir, Sierra juniper, incense cedar, and quaking aspen trees. This area is a montane climate characterized by a cool, wet higher country and drier, more arid lower elevations. In the morning of October 12, 2009, 83-year-old Orville Sanders was up bear hunting with three of his friends. Orville stood at six feet tall and was husky, healthy, and strong for his age. He'd been hunting black bears since he was 12 years old, and the rigorous activity helped him stay fit physically and mentally. Orville and his friends would utilize hounds to pursue black bears, and the pursuit would end in the bear escaping or climbing into a tree to avoid the baying hounds. Most hunts would consist of hounds pursuing the bear for two or three hours, and Orville enjoyed hearing them bay as they trailed the scent of the bears. The hunters didn't always kill a bear when they treed one. Only after examining the bear did the hunters decide if they wanted the meat and the pelt did they kill one. They never killed a bear and left it, though, as they were ethical hunters and demonstrated appreciation and respect for their hunting traditions. Along with Orville were his longtime friends, Charlie Brown and Ron Boyd. His friends would come in very important in today's episode. The bear hunters had turned the hounds out on a scent trail earlier in the morning and had listened as the hounds bayed as they pursued the bear for almost an hour. Once a bear climbs a tree, the hounds baying turns into howling, and that is the signal for the men to pull their hounds off the trail. At that point, they will either let the bear go, or they'll shoot it and claim its carcass and place their tag on it. As the hunters made their way toward the bear, they carried hunting rifles, and no source indicated that they had brought bear spray along with them. Once they arrived where the hounds were, they were surprised to see three black bears in the same tree. They examined the bears to see if they wanted to shoot any of them. This season, the hounds had treed 18 bears, and these three brought the total to 21. All prior bears treed had been passed on by the hunters. They were either too small or had an uninteresting color pattern, but one of the bears treed today was a little different. It was a big bear in brown, which is known as a cinnamon bear. One of the hunters decided he would take it. He raised his rifle and shot the bear while it was poised in the tree limbs. Now Orville knew better than to stand too close to a treed bear. At this point, the bears had been pursued over miles of rough terrain. They would likely be exhausted and in a bad mood due to being chased by the hounds. As Orville stood about 50 feet from the tree, his friend fired his rifle and shot the bear in the chest. The impact of the bullet knocked the bear off balance, and it tumbled to the ground. Half expecting the bear to be dead, Orville was surprised to see it spring back and immediately dash toward him. 
As it approached him, it stood on its hind legs, popping its jaws as its paws reached toward the man. Seeing the bear closing in on Orville, Boyd fired and hit the bear two times, but the wounded bear continued to focus on his hunting partner. Orville didn't have time to react to the angry bear, and held his rifle between them as a sort of shield. The bear bit down on Orville's rifle and right through his hand holding it. It shook its head and clamped its jaws onto his left forearm. As the massive, angry black bear tore gashes into Orville's forearm, he jammed his thumb into its ears and twisted. He was hoping to irritate the bear into releasing his forearm from its jaws, but was tossed around as the bear tried to tear off his arm. That's when Charlie joined the fight by putting the boot to the bear. He kicked the bear several times and successfully distracted the bear from killing Orville, but now it focused its anger on him. Before Charlie could escape, the bear bit onto his leg and began pulling him toward its mouth with its paws. Orville didn't want to shoot Charlie, so he threw his rifle to him instead. Given he was now being tossed around by the bear, Charlie missed the catch and dropped the rifle nearby. He bent over and picked it up while he was being shaken back and forth to try to defend himself. The man turned the rifle toward the bear and fired, striking the bear in the neck. With four bullet holes punched in its vitals, the bear slowly lost its energy and died. With the bear no longer a threat, the hunters turned to examining Orville's injuries. His left forearm was a bloody mess. As the men tied a handkerchief around it, they could see Orville's wrist bones, now barren of skin. Blood poured out of Orville's wrist due to arteries being severed. Now aware of how severe Orville's injuries were, they knew he'd need immediate medical attention. They helped him into Boyd's pickup and piled in alongside their friend. Beating way too fast on the winding mountain roads, they headed toward Camptonville. Along their way, the hunters ran into a California Department of Fish and Game ranger. They called for a medical helicopter to fly Orville to Sutter Roseville Medical Center in Roseville, California. Afterward, Orville remembered being placed in the truck one moment and waking up in the hospital the next. The medical team at the hospital indicated that Orville had lost four pints of blood, which was almost half of the average person's volume of ten pints. Doctors told him that he would have died from blood loss in an hour if he hadn't made it to the hospital. The medical staff cleaned Orville's wounds for two hours and did their best to cover his exposed forearm bones. They determined that his forearm was broken in four places, which required surgery for repair. They also discovered a bite to his right arm, which he wasn't aware of. He also received rabies vaccinations, just in case the bear had the disease. While he was at the hospital, fish and game rangers interviewed him about the details of the attack. Orville found out that the bear weighed just under 200 pounds. Its head was taken for rabies examination, which proved to be negative. Following this bear attack, Orville indicated that he would not stop hound hunting for bears. His left thumb is left stiff permanently, preventing him from carrying a rifle, but he can still listen to the hounds. In California, bear hunting season begins in October and runs until the allotted number of bears are killed. The state issues 1,700 permits and usually harvests, usually hunters harvest about one-third of the allotted numbers of bears each year. As for his hunting partners, seeing their friend mauled by an angry black bear did nothing to quell their desire to hunt bears. They took the hounds out for a hunt the following Wednesday, still hoping to fill their tags. After reviewing the details of Orville's attack, I have a few questions for you. Do you think bear spray would have stopped this angry and wounded bear from attacking Orville? Why do you think Orville didn't shoot the bear as it closed in on him? What are your thoughts about hound hunting for black bears? Did an era of tough bear hunters end when Orville passed away a few years ago? All I can say is that I hope I can still do what I enjoy into my 80s. I'll gladly read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.